Brilliant. Right. So let's crack on. We are going to do the student and new grad room room um, this evening. So um, what I have been doing is some live videos on YouTube mostly, um, which I've called the room room, where I've been talking about different topics uh, to do with rheumatology. And I had a few people, uh, Lewis Lovegrove for one, um, and some others requesting in about what students and new grads should know about rheumatology and I thought you know let's do a specific one for you guys and see if I can help you out a little bit give you some advice and hopefully direct you on some further learning as we go along about what you can do with rheumatology because it is rather difficult um, it is not an easy subject to cover um, I teach a whole day's course on it and we're going to do hopefully about 30 minutes if not maybe a little bit longer um, about some some advice on how to deal with rheumatology if it comes in for you in clinic and then um, we will go from there so hopefully you'll find this useful if we do find this really good then um, I might make this a monthly thing um, as long as we can keep up the numbers and hopefully everything will be good so I'm going to share my screen and let's hope that um, this all goes according to plan with regards to the technology There we go. There's my little waving face. Look, I'm just going to check on my phone, make sure all the technology is working. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Silver, saying all good. Um, so first thing we're just going to quickly discuss, and if you can hear my cat in the background, I apologize about that. Um, it's one of the uh, hazards of working from home at the moment, isn't it? It's animal noise. Um, so my name is Jack March, and I am a rheumatology specialist. Um, and I qualified in 2008 from the University of Plymouth, which seems like a very long time ago now. Um, I specialised into rheumatology in 2011, um, worked directly in a rheumatology department for um, about seven years, I think. I think it was about 20, 2018, maybe a little bit, maybe tail end of 2017. Um, I worked in the rheumatology department. I got to do pretty much everything you can think of. I was very lucky. I got to run my own clinics, um, do rehab, see patients on behalf of the rheumatologists, do follow-up clinics, order MRIs, x-rays, bloods, uh, monitor, newly diagnosed, you name it, I got to do it. I was very lucky. I also got to spend a lot of time doing um, different CPD courses and things like that. Um, so that was great. I then left um, to go and do some different things really um, and ended up in orthopedics a foot and ankle orthopedics clinic for about six months I then went back to rheumatology for about six months and now um, I work for Nuffield Health so I'm what they call an advanced level physio which is a very nice name for someone who sees things that are a little bit complicated um, but basically my patient caseload is made up of back pain with ridiculous symptoms so back pain with sciatica or neck pain with arm pain and multiple joint pain so anybody who's got multiple joint pains and then some people I'll see who have uh, been through other physiotherapists and are struggling either they're not getting better or uh, they're unsure of the diagnosis or they need imaging something like that so the complicated stuff comes through to me which is a really fun job um, and I enjoy that immensely though not doing it very much at the moment due to uh, this all this COVID-19 stuff um, a lot of the time I work for Choose Health. I do some second opinion work for them with rheumatology patients, um, see patients from all over the country, uh, well, the UK really. Um, and then coming with that, I do the Physio Matters podcast. So hopefully everybody listening has uh, tuned into the Physio Matters podcast in the, in the past. And um, we do the monthly podcast and some other stuff as well. And that's very much worth checking out for some uh, further learning. A couple of podcasts on there from me about rheumatology, one with Dr. Carl Gaffney on um, axial spondyloarthritis and one on uh, just rheumatology in general with uh, my good friend Mike Dare. Um, that's good worth a chat as well. My website is at the bottom there, rheumatology.physio. Um, it's going through a rebuild at the moment, so it looks rather bizarre, but most of it still works. There are some free blogs on there, which um, many of you might find quite interesting about uh, 24 hours our patterns of symptoms and um, bloods and various other bits um, conditions and things which give a little bit more detail and then you can follow me on social media I'm at physio jack on twitter and rheumatology.physio anywhere else um, I have I'm lucky enough now these days if you type in rheumatology physio I come up pretty much near the top um, so that's really good 
Oh, one thing I shouldn't forget. Hopefully everybody signed up for a ticket for Therapy Live, uh, therapy-live.co.uk. I am talking there. I'm going to do some clinical reasoning in the upper limb regarding rheumatology. Um, and I've also got a stand there as well, uh, talking about all the things that my brand offers. I'm not very good at um, self-promotion, really. Um, but um, I do rheumatology courses. Um, and what else do I do? I have booklets. I have a rheumatology booklet, which is a, like a reference guide, which I'll show you later and some other things like that. Um, but it's all on my website. So just go and have a look there if you want to. Um, mostly I tweet it if I'm doing anything fun or interesting. So enough about me. Um, we'll just check on. Uh, that's the booklet that I talked about that is available. Like I said, my website's a bit dodgy at the moment. But if you just do rheumatologyphysio.ecwid. Um, dot com and uh, that will get you to my shop it does cost you a little bit of money I'm afraid um, but um, they're really good they've been really popular I've also got one on spinal masqueraders written by Andrew Cuff so um, they're worth checking out um, if you want a little bit of something to remind you in clinic of the symptoms and things like that um, when you're working so let's uh, shut up about me um, so why do we want to discuss rheumatology in musculoskeletal practice and especially why do we really want to discuss it as new grads and students like i said i get the complicated stuff but um almost all of my referrals come through another physiotherapist so one of the things that um, is very important in rheumatology is that a lot of the conditions do masquerade as a musculoskeletal condition so the first presenting symptoms are often back pain or a tendinopathy um, or just multiple joint pains and that is extremely common in a musculoskeletal environment so if i think about how many patients in a week attend to my clinic with back pain or tendinopathy that's a very high percentage and some of those are going to have a rheumatology underlying issue that's causing those and if you think about those conditions as well, then the most likely place, if you go to your GP with a tendon problem or back pain, the most likely place they're going to send you is to the physiotherapist um, or osteopath or chiropractor or a similar type profession. So a lot of those patients do come through musculoskeletal practice. The other thing we need to remember is that GPs are really good at picking up the barn door presentations of these conditions. They're really good at it. They will send them through to rheumatology. They'll never get to you as physiotherapists. The problem comes in that either you don't have a screening from a GP, so you're the first person getting to them, or the other thing is that you're going to get the complicated ones, the ones that aren't obvious, um, the ones that aren't clear, the ones where you've got to do a little bit of digging. Um, so it's really important in musculoskeletal practice that we are considering these, di um, these conditions in our differential diagnosis. One of the things that we do need to mention is that there is a significant delay to diagnosis with a lot of these conditions um, and that needs to come down. And unfortunately, some of that is due to it being missed by health care clinicians. So um, there is research to show that some of them, some of the conditions have up to an eight and a half year average delay in diagnosis, which is ridiculous. Um, and they've seen multiple professionals previously. So some people along the line haven't asked the right questions or not joined the dots. And unfortunately, that patient's been missed. And something that's very important is that the delay to diagnosis is incredibly important with regards to patient outcomes. So it's almost linear line where you get this delay to diagnosis and deterioration of symptoms. So outcomes um, such as function, use of um, healthcare resources, uh, pain levels are all related to how long they waited for their delay to diagnosis, which is rather unfortunate. So that's why we did it. The other reason we're going to do this today is I had a lot of help when I was a junior uh, member of staff um, and we had a lot of help now. Um, and I feel like it's something that I can do to give back and hopefully you'll find it's useful um, and supplement some of your learning from, from, uh, from university. Um, so just quickly, we'll do a quick overview of rheumatology and rheumatology is a branch of medicine is incredibly complicated so there's well over 200 disorders affecting muscles soft tissues bones joints ligaments you name it tendons um, and, they, and they all blend into an overlapping mess of conditions now we don't need to worry about all of them and certainly you guys don't need to worry about a lot of them at the moment um, but what it is being well aware of is that a lot of those do as i said mimic a musculoskeletal disorder now we do need to include things like osteoarthritis which is 
more of a you could call it a metabolic condition rather than a sort of a grinding wear and tear condition for sure uh, but we've also got more common conditions um, such as osteoporosis uh, which is massively underdiagnosed in the community um, and rheumatoid arthritis which most people have heard of and then the spondyloarthritis which we'll talk about today as well We've got more complicated um, conditions such as the connective tissue disorders, which we're going to leave well alone today because I just don't have the time um, to go through everything with you, unfortunately. But maybe we'll do that on another webinar. So we're going to have a quick look at some conditions here. So in the um, box on the left of your screen is rheumatoid arthritis and spondyloarthritis. So um, those are sort of the arthritides or the uh, conditions that are affecting, affecting the joints. Uh, or arthropathies would be a good term for them. And then on the right hand side, we've got connective tissue disorders, um, which are getting a lot more complicated. So we'll stick in the left box here at the moment. And um, the important thing to remember here is the ones on the left here are going to make up the bulk of conditions that you see in clinic. We're going to ignore hypermobility um, with regards to this because that is ex obviously extremely common, but doesn't have an inflammatory underlying cause. So we're going to make up the bulk of our recognition from room from rheumatoid arthritis and spondyloarthritis. So these are what we would call auto inflammatory conditions. So you can break down, you break everything down in medicine to layers. So if you talk about autoimmunity, then an auto inflammatory condition would come under that. So an autoimmune conditions um, are where your immune system starts to, for want of a better term, attack. Uh, a part of your body um, and within rheumatology what we're looking at is the part of the immune system that's going sort of haywire is the inflammatory system so if you imagine you've got things like white blood cells um, phagocytes for example um, and T cells those kind of things then um, T cells do have a role in regulating the inflammatory system but that's not necessarily what we're interested in at the moment what we're looking at is more the inflammatory system affecting the um, the parts of the joint which we'll talk about in a minute um, so it's, it's part of inflammation so it's an auto-inflammatory condition if you called it an autoimmune condition no one's going to mind it's not wrong uh, we just try and be a little bit correct with our terminology so the difference here between rheumatoid arthritis and those spondyloarthritis conditions is rheumatoid arthritis is primarily what we call a synovitic condition so um, the inflammatory system affects the synovium primarily of the joints and then spondyloarthritis is enthesitic so it will primarily affect the enthesis um, of ligaments tendons so as they blend to bone um, they are that's where the inflammatory reaction is going to occur so um, with rheumatoid arthritis you're considering that sort of balloon type structure around the joint um, that's the synovium and that's what gets affected by the immune system and you get this synovitis where the immune system causes swelling of that so thickening of the synovium which causes more in, in inflammatory infiltrate into the joint but also more joint fluid and that's where you get the swelling and that inflammatory reaction from whereas the spondyloarthritis what we're talking about is the enthesis so as you've got your tendon and it blending into bone bit of a crude analogy with my fingertips here but uh, it blends into bone here um, and this area is where, where it's blending that's where we're going to get the same sort of inflammatory reaction like I said at the beginning these these conditions do overlap significantly and you will see some patients with um, the spondyloarthritis that have a lot of synovitis and you will see some rheumatoid arthritis patients with um, enthesitis although it's a tenosynovitis where the, um, the tenosynovium of the tendon is more likely affected in rheumatoid uh, but we don't need to go too much in depth for that today but when you're trying to do differential diagnosis if you remember the synovitis versus the enthesitis then you wish then you should be able to work out which end of this um, differential diagnosis you're shooting at so if you've got someone mostly with swollen hot joints rather than um, tendon problems then you can think more of a rheumatoid arthritic pattern as opposed to like I said someone with tendon problems uh, they're more likely going to be or the back pain I should say as well as tendon problems more likely onto the spondyloarthritis pattern um, so rheumatoid arthritis is a, is a uh, condition under itself and then what we've got is spondyloarthritis which we would call an umbrella condition so 
uh, under spondyloarthritis, what we get is a number of conditions. So um, ankylosing spondylitis, most people have heard of, um, psoriatic arthritis and enteropathic spondylitis. Spondyl Sorry, I'm going to mess, mess my words up already. Enteropathic spondylitis, which is spondylitis related to the gut. Um, we also get what we call axial spondyloarthritis, which um, is sort of another almost umbrella term versus a peripheral spondyloarthritis. So um, if you take the take spondyloarthritis at the top, that incorporates everything. If you imagine like a, an evolution tree as you as you come down. So we'd have spondyloarthritis at the top. That's all those emphasitic conditions. Then we come down and we split into um, peripheral spondylitis and axial spondylitis. And that's purely to do with the predominant symptoms. So it doesn't actually matter um, in the grand scheme of things, especially at, um, even really at my level, it doesn't matter which one they've got. Um, it's just the predomination of symptoms. So someone with peripheral spondylitis would just have a predomination of symptoms that are in the periphery as opposed to the, sp to the axial spine. So the spine and the sacroiliac joints, as opposed to someone with an axial spondyloarthritis who would predominate back pain and sacroiliac joint pain, they still might have peripheral symptoms as well. So it doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things, really. So if you look at ankylosing spondylitis, that's a fit under axial um, and psoriatic arthritis um, and enteropathic usually fit under peripheral, um, although sometimes they go axial as well. So it, it doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things, but it's an interesting thing to know. Um, as you go further through um, into learning more, there is some differences in bloods and um, presentations and, and all these kind of things, but um, far outside of the reach of our webinar today. But hopefully you just remember that if you take home nothing else from me today, you're looking for um, synovitic or emphasis, uh, uh, sorry, synovitic or emphasitic conditions. And then on that right hand side, we've got connective tissue disorders, uh, lupus, Sjogren's, um, not very common um, and present with all sorts of bizarre symptoms. Hypermobility um, is a whole kettle of fish under itself. Um, and then we're talking sort of vasculitis as well, which is getting a bit more nasty. So. One of the things that I talk about a lot in rheumatology is we need to understand when we're looking at inflammatory symptoms, but we also need to understand when we're looking at something that is a systemic inflammatory condition. So it's not simply enough to go, that joint is inflamed. That's not going to be wrong. That's, you're probably going to be right over that. Um, and usually what's going to happen is you'll see heat, redness, swelling and pain. So if I sprain my ankle or hit my thumb with a hammer, it's probably the joint's probably going to go hot it's probably going to get red it's probably going to get swollen it's probably going to get painful but what a lot of people do a lot of therapists do is then stop at that point and they go right that's inflamed uh we'll treat that with anti-inflammatories or ice or graded exercise or uh, relative rest graded functional improvement whatever it is and they forget that actually that's not sufficient to understand exactly what's going on so if you see these types of symptoms, and like we said, we're predominantly talking about today either in the joints or the tendons, then what we need to do is dig further. Um, so I want more information. If I get a referral that looks like that, they said uh, the joint is hot, red, swollen, and painful, um, and stops, I'm not very happy about it, okay? So what I wanna see is then further questioning into those. So when you talk about what, a systemic inflammatory pattern and we'll talk about what the systemic part means in a bit um, you'll get some more signs related to the inflammatory pattern that you need to dig out um, so we're looking at joint stiffness and that will occur in both of the types of conditions we're talking about so this the emphasitic and the synovitic conditions and that's joint stiffness that's predominantly in the early morning lasting longer than 30 minutes and if the patient volunteers the word stiffness then that's quite predictive of them having a rheumatology issue so they'll say things like, oh, my hands, they're just, they act like a claw for 30 minutes before they start to ease out a little bit. Um, and that's, that's really common. Or the spinal problems, my back is really stiff in the mornings for about an hour before it starts to improve. The other thing that we need to look for is night pain. Um, and I'm sure you were all taught at university that night pain is a red flag. I don't like night pain at all. But we need to dig deeper than that. So night pain, we're looking um, again, either in the joints or the back. Um, and it's usually waking the patient up around the second half of the night. So around 2, 3 a.m. 
uh, they'll wake up with this night pain and it's not simply a case of rolling over in bed they will have to get up and move around do something take some anti-inflammatories um, feel better before they can go back to bed and, roll, and go to sleep they can't just roll over fall back to sleep again unfortunately so you really got a question into the depth of that night pain what is happening to them what are the symptoms like when is it waking them how long is that lasting for do they have to do anything to ease it off and then we have better with activity and worse with rest if you think about all of the conditions or a lot of conditions that you see most of them are better with rest and worse with activity so let's take my my hit thumb with hammer or my sprained ankle i'm clearly going to be better if i rest my ankle um, or i'm going to rest my thumb in the short term it's clearly not going to be better with a with a sprained ankle to go for a run my ankle's not going to feel better whereas these patients that's the opposite way around so their backs feel better they love going to the gym they love walking around they hate sitting at the desk they hate sitting in the car they're walking about they're doing stuff they're on the phone walking around in the in the clinic room when you're talking to them uh, they're walking about they don't sit down and that is really common and you'll get this return of that stiffness that joint stiffness when they rest when they sit still and you'll really see it they'll drive to oh uh, woke up in the morning my back was stiff for 30 minutes and then i got in it eased off then i got in the car to drive to work and again it's stiff again for 30 minutes after sitting um, really common um, things to look out for and then of course better with anti-inflammatories um, we don't usually associate back pain really with being, being better with anti-inflammatories certainly not with any significance and these patients will get a lot better with anti-inflammatories so hopefully that gives you an idea on how to um, question those people a little bit more deeply so then we move on to the systemic nature of these conditions so like i said this is a problem going wrong with the immune system the inflammatory system it's not an external force whacking you like a like a hammer so what happens is there's inflammation in the bloodstream things are going it going haywire and other systems are affected now admittedly in rheumatoid arthritis that's far 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 less the case so in the spondyloarthritis or the enthesitic conditions that's much more the case um, and we're looking at different systems and this is where it's very 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 easy to miss those patients as they present in clinic because they might present with a reasonable mechanism of injury I've seen patients who have fallen, um, they've twisted playing sports, um, they've given themselves tennis elbow by painting a house. They've got a really sensible mechanism of injury, but you question them a little bit deeper and it turns out they have all these other systems affected. And there's no way in any sensible imagination that painting the house is going to give you psoriasis for example it just doesn't happen so you do have to ask the ask these questions a little bit more deeply and that's what i meant when i get these referrals in and people just haven't gone that extra step and you just think all you needed to do was just ask two more questions you'd have been there but you've got to know what you're looking for so we're looking at the skin being affected and we'll go through this in a bit more detail on the i think it's on the next slide the skin being affected so like i said psoriasis and some of these conditions present with a rash eyes inflammatory conditions of the eyes the gut that's what we talk about with enteropathic so it's crohn's colitis the nails can be affected enthesitis as we talked about so that would be peripheral so we're talking achilles tendons um, and uh, plantar fascia most commonly uh, dactylitis which is a sausage digit which is a swelling of a whole finger or, th or uh, toe and then i'm i'm asking if they've got a past medical history of that whether they've currently got that or if they've got a family history of any of those conditions and i'll add a similar weight to all of those um, moving forwards and then we do want to know about the onset um, sometimes like i said they've got a convincing mechanism of onset other times not so much um, they might have an insidious onset the other thing to remember is some of these conditions these inflammatory conditions will trigger with an infection um, so something like a sexually transmitted infection or the uh, or the flu um, can trigger these conditions so just check about what their onset was like hal it is on the next slide so someone brilliant to follow on uh, twitter is paul Cohen. he's not on there a ton but when he does tweet um, it is absolutely brilliant um, and this is a moniker uh, called screendom that he developed where he created it to remind you um, of the different uh, associated conditions let's say of um, spondyloarthritis and this is available as a free download um, you can see it on the screen there uh, or it's on my website you just go to the knee resource uh, just type knee resource into google and it comes up um, or it is on my website it's a free pdf you can just print it out keep it in clinic 
um, reminds you very nicely um, exactly what to look for. So as we talked about, the skin is affected um, in 6 to 42 percent of um, patients who, who, sorry, 6 to 42 percent of, sorry, uh, sorry, let me start from scratch. <laughs> 6 to 42 percent of patients with psoriasis will go on to develop psoriatic arthritis and the big wide gap is to do with how you define both of those conditions so if you've got anybody in with joint pains um, or anybody with a tendon and you don't ask them a, a tendon problem like achilles tendinopathy plantar fasciopathy um, tennis elbow golfer's elbow and you don't ask them about whether they've got psoriasis or a family history of psoriasis then you can just imagine the little jack sitting on your shoulder thinking that you've not asked all the questions that you need to ask. Um, same with Crohn's and colitis. Um, prevalence of, of developing a spondyloarthritis, 20, 26%, so one in four at six years. So within six years of being diagnosed with colitis or Crohn's, one in four developed spondyloarthritis. So same, if you haven't asked them about colitis or Crohn's um, and they've got a tendon problem, um, then like I say, little Jack's not going to be not going to be very happy when he's uh, when he's yelling in your ear whether you've met missed a rheumatology condition. Uh, relatives, so like we talked about, family history of all those conditions. The eyes, we're looking at iritis and uveitis. Again, very common. It's a pretty uncommon condition, but it's very common to then develop a spondyloarthritis or uh, have it related to that. The early morning stiffness, like we talked about, the joint stiffness, the nails, um, different type of nail bed changes that you can see. So be looking at people's nails when they come into clinic. Dactylitis is the swelling of a digit. Enthesitis, like we talked about. Um, so a lot of these patients have got Achilles tendinopathy um, or uh, plantar fascia. So in in, in um, order of likelihood, uh, Achilles tendinopathy and plantar, plantar fasciitis, those are the top two. Then we're looking at the elbow tendons, then lateral glute, and then the others are all sort of a bit even. Um, and then the movement and medication effects. So that's the better with activity, worse with rest, and the favourable response to uh, non-steroidals. Um, so if you've got that in clinic, um, then and you go through that with most of your patients, it doesn't take very long. You just add it to your general health questioning, um, you know, and um, it's very quick to rule out. Well, certainly uh, give you more questions to ask if you, if you get any of those coming back positive. But you can imagine a lot of those do not come up on your general health screening. I was taught as a student threads which i still use to this day so uh, thyroid heart uh, rheumatology which then would incorporate all of these uh, epilepsy asthma diabetes and steroids uh, if my memory serves me correctly um, but that includes absolutely none of these so um, it is worth adding in like i say if you've got uh, someone with a tendon problem or with joint pain that's quite a lot of people uh, but like i said we are missing a lot of these conditions so it is worth being questioned for rheumatoid arthritis, I have created this little document. And again, this is available on my website. Um, it's pretty easy to find on there. Um, and it's um, you print it out back to back and it takes you through um, the symptoms that are most likely to occur and how many you would want to uh, get a score to be considering something like rheumatoid arthritis. There is a more complicated version here, um, which you can use, but you do need blood results for that to work. So. Uh, most of the time we'll be using this, other times we'll be using this, but it's a good reminder of um, symptoms that we're just looking out for. Uh, and then I go through uh, how we use it and uh, what we do with that information once we do it. Okay, so hopefully, have I stuck to my 30 minutes? Bang on 30 minutes, there we go. Um, you can't um, complain about that. So I'm just going to have a look at the questions here. I've got them up on my phone. Um, hopefully everybody's still with me. And um, the first one I've got here, Saffron says, and apologies if I pronounce anybody's name wrong. I'm awful at names. Um, is this being recorded slash accessible after this event? Yes, Saffron, I will uh, put this up on my YouTube channel, um, which you can find pretty easily. Again, just in YouTube, just type rheumatology physio um, into YouTube. And I think I come up on the top one. Uh, so it will be there accessible for you. Um, Toya says, would Ehlers-Dan loss syndrome be a rheumatoid condition? That's a really good question. Um, it has nothing to do with um, systemic inflammatory condition. Rheumatologists don't really like it because they can't treat it with medications. Um, so there's not really a lot for them to do other than diagnostically 
but it does present into rheumatology a lot because of its multiple joint pains. Um, I could do a whole, probably a whole whole morning's talk on um, hypermobility syndromes, um, but if you ask me directly, I would say it's not a rheumatology condition, but it does come under rheumatology a lot because, like I said, it presents with the multiple joint pains. So it's difficult. Um, the other real difficulty is the is the um, difference between hypermobility syndromes and um, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome being clinically almost indistinguishable. Um, so that's a really difficult one to do. Um, Sophie says, um, do symptoms always progressively worsen in rheumatological conditions or can they wax and wane? That's a brilliant question. So the way that I describe it um, to patients is that everybody has a unique immune system and everybody's response is unique. So you will get some patients who take a course, let's just linear deterioration. And unfortunately for some of them, they doesn't matter what you do. Um, they are in the minority, but no matter how many drugs you give them, uh, no matter what you do, they just continue to get worse. Most people will do that and then dip off with medications. Then you'll get some people who get a real severe flare and then they'll go down and they'll have no symptoms whatsoever for months, maybe even years, and then it will come back again. Sometimes it never comes back and they just have this transient one off. Uh, but a lot of them will, it will come back at some point. And then you'll get an up and down waxing and waning. Some people's symptoms might disappear completely. Some people's might not. They might get a linear up and down progression deterioration. They might not. Um, and other people get a combination of all of those. Um, so hopefully that answers that question, but it is all over the place. So no two rheumatology patients will be the same with their progression. Um, what I always say to people is, if you're, or therapist certainly, if you're suspecting a rheumatology condition, um, you, it is very difficult for you to say whether someone's going to have bad prognosis or a good prognosis. There is some ways to do it, but again, they're unique. So you will get some people who have no bad prognostic factors but they have terrible disease so the first thing you've got to do is get them into rheumatology rheumatology will attempt to get their inflammation down as quickly as possible um, and then you move away move on from there and hopefully you keep the inflammation down you improve their function and all those kind of things um, sylvan says uh, what is your view on using ice to reduce inflammation in an msk setting um, my understanding, Sylvan, would be ice is really good for symptomatic relief, um, but it's not going to do a lot for the underlying process. Um, it'd be good for good for reducing swelling to a degree, good for reducing heat of the joint, um, but even in acute sort of inflammatory um, uh, injuries, let's say, let's call them, it's like an ankle sprain, it's not really going to do a lot for the underlying inflammatory process you also have to remember that um, we need the inflammatory process to a degree to heal any damage that's occurred so you just got to be careful with the application of ice however symptomatically it can work really nicely so um, I will often give it a go for trip for patients to if it's the only thing that will give them symptomatic relief um, then by all means absolutely use it um, certainly in rheumatology conditions it will have no bearing on the outcome over a long period of time but it might reduce their symptoms for a short period Chloe says thank you no worries Chloe thank you for joining Alex says can pain radiate away from the joint um, not 100% sure I understand the question, Alex, but yes. Um, so you, depending on the severity, you tend to get, um, you might get a wider spread pain. Uh, we also know that people who have more pain are more likely to get more pain, if that makes sense. Um, plus, it also depends how much of the tendon is involved. So certainly in rheumatoid arthritis, like I said, the tenosynovitis um, can affect the, the tendon and that can spread quite a good chunk away from the joint so if you imagine now uh, let's take the mcp um, of the hand and let's say the extensor tendon is affected then you will get pain that comes quite a good chunk away uh, from the joint um, so it can radiate quite a lot but most people um, it will be joint pain specifically um, and that stiffness that they'll complain of what would i say alex another question what would i say is the best management for arthritis um, so it's, it is quite hierarchical and um, despite what we see on social media, unfortunately, uh, medication comes top. Uh, my cats are having a fight as well. So medications come top. 
um, for these inflammatory conditions. So in rheumatoid arthritis, it would be a combination of steroids and what we call disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs um, to get the inflammation down. In the spondylitis, so the um, emphasitic condition, we're looking at non-steroidal anti-inflammatories to start with, um, but then they move on to uh, what's called anti-TNF, which interrupts the um, um, inflammatory pathway. So TNF is an uh, inflammatory uh, mediator. It upregulates the inflammatory system. So if you um, anti it, so you stop it from occurring, then it, it, the inflammatory system deregulates, downregulates. Carl Nan, I'm not even going to try. Sorry, Carl. Um, will all patients with an axial spondylitis show on MRI? No, is the answer to that question. Um, the about a third of them will show on their first MRI, um, either in the sacroiliac joints or into the spine. Um, and then it people have done in the past serial MRI, so over a few months, and it does that's not particularly effective either. Um, so, so, so not all patients will show on an MRI. MRI is extremely useful and is the gold standard imaging technique for spondylitis, um, but uh, not everybody shows up on it. So it's not the be all and end all. This is why rheumatologists exist, because they're incredibly clever people who can map all these things together. What is interesting, though, is it doesn't seem to matter whether you have MRI changes or not. Outcomes seem to be the same. So the severity, so pain, loss of function, medication use, all those things tend to um, tend to be the same, regardless of whether it shows up on MRI. Just as an interesting note as well, women don't seem to show up on MRI quite so often as men do. Sophie says, open brackets, as in prior to diagnosis slash medication. Oh, yeah, so uh, no change to my answer, Sophie, uh, to the previous one. That was about uh, the waxing and waning um, nature of the symptoms. Uh, prior to diagnosis and medication, they'll get the same, they're all over the place, um, any type of progress that you might see. Hopefully with the medication, they will then take a more steady course, but ideally come down. Saffron says, what exercises are the worst to prescribe for rheumatology patients? There's technically no bad exercise um, to prescribe for a rheumatology patient. Uh, they can do high intensity exercises, um, a really good review if you want to read it, um, pitched at a great level, was written by Chris Marty. If you find him on Twitter, you'll find a link to that paper. It's open access. You can read all about the exercises um, for, rheumat for axial spinal arthritis. And to be honest, it would uh, map onto a rheumatoid patient anyway. Um, so there are no bad exercises. They can do what they like. Um, I try to err onto the higher intensity side of things because uh, I think it's more beneficial for their comorbidities. Um, but be pa patient preference led. So whatever they want to do, try and uh, help them to do that. Um, so hopefully that answers that question. I suppose the what exercise is the worst to prescribe would be no exercise. <laughs> That's a cheating answer. Heather Wesson says, thanks. Thank you, Heather. Um, Nicholas says, what's the difference in prognosis for seronegative versus seropositive rheumatoid arthritis? Um, on that's a really good question, Nicholas. So, zero positive is related to the blood results. Um, so traditionally rheumatoid factor, but you can also use um anti CCP for that. Although about ninety five percent of them are um positive for anti CCP, so it's a bit difficult. Um, in the theoretically, if you look on a large enough scale, so you look at a not large enough number of patients. Um, the patients with a raised rheumatoid factor are more likely to have a more severe di disease. Um, so that would be a negative pro prognostic factor, would be a higher rheumatoid factor at diagnosis. But equally, there are some outliers to that as well, like we just discussed. So um, some patients with a rheumatoid factor of like three will still get a terrible disease. Um, and some patients with a rheumatoid factor of 800, um, uh, there's not, it's a bit mild. Um, so I think there's a lot of other mitigating factors. Uh, Christopher Gibson says, um, do you find paraffin wax an effective treatment modality? Um, I repeat my answer for ice. Good for symptomatic relief. Um, not good for a lot else. Uh, feels nice. Tends to come with a massage and that always feels nice. I've never seen any evidence that it, it's got any other benefit other than that. Um, one thing that we used to use it for, and we, I say we, I wasn't really allowed near it. I'm a bit of a clumsy oaf. So uh, my o occupational therapy colleagues used to do it. Um, so if we had some really severely 
affected uh, function patients. And they would come in, have some wax treatment, and that would allow them to then do some exercises or some functional practice. So it's a bit of a gateway thing, a bit like uh, we might use something like manual therapy or something. Um, so it's difficult because they, uh, I remember we, our wax bath broke. Um, we were trying to get funding to buy a new one and we were struggling. Um, where are we at to with time? Right, we've eight forty-five. So we're gonna go. We're gonna go a couple more questions. So get, get your questions in quickly now. Um, I apologise. Uh, I'm going to butcher this name. Uh, Tarushi, sorry, apologies. Um, asks: Is the same treatment plan applied for juvenile arthritis? From a therapist therapist point of view, yes. Um, Although I have to admit the evidence base is a bit more sketchy. Um, the, you've obviously got to be careful with the younger children that you don't put them off uh, therapies. Um, and if they think that they can come in and get pain and not going to like it very much, then I think there's got to be a consideration there. But nothing that I've read set has said that high intensity exercise, those kind of things is going to be a problematic for them. Uh, so, yes, technically you could treat them the same. Um, the medication use is different because obviously they're children. Um, and I leave that to the specialist rheumatologists. Um, but from a therapy point of view, yes, pretty much the same, but just take into consideration that they might be coming to for a very long time um, and you want to keep them on board. So you might need to be maybe nicer to them than I am to, their, to my patients. Uh, Carl says, uh, what are the most common symptoms you tend to see in an early rheumatoid arthritis person patient? So rheumatoid arthritis, we're looking for uh, peripheral joint stiffness. So uh, classically, that's the MCPJs. Um, and the MTPJs of the feet, um, swelling, redness, heat, temperature. So any combination of those five. Um, and if I didn't say pain, then add that one to it as well. So any combination of those, you might only get one, which makes it really difficult. Multiple joints, although sometimes you will get a, a singular joint um, as well. Um, and you've really got to dig in. Uh, so that early morning joint stiffness lasting more than 30 minutes, the MCPJ is affected. And if you saw my um, uh, sheet, uh, which is it gives you um, the most, I think it's seven um, um, symptoms to look out for. Um, and then three or more out of, out of seven of those is um, predictive of um, a rheumatology, a rheumatoid arthritis type diagnosis. It's not a guarantee, just predictive. Um, so that's a really useful thing to use. Um, and then we're looking at the things like, um, I've accidentally hit my, my mouse button. Um, we're looking at things like the uh, family history um, of inflammatory conditions as well. Um, so final question, Toya says, where can I find that PDF on your website? Um, right, let's see whether we can do it together. So if you go um, to, this is my website, as you can see, it's a bit under uh, development at the moment. And if you go down to uh, suspecting rheumatoid arthritis, so the website, just type rheumatology.physio in and um, scroll down and find suspecting rheumatoid arthritis, click on that. Um, and then you, there, there's the overlay and you can just click on it there and you can download it for free. Um, from there um, and feel free to do that. Um, I lost, I did have a counter one time and it had, was uh, about over 10,000 of those downloaded. So I was very proud of that, um, but I lost the counter. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and you get my giant face back and hopefully you found that as, as of use. Um, any feedback would be brilliant. So just leave that for me at uh, any time. And um, I'm very grateful for you spending your evening with me. And if uh, there's enough interest, then we'll run this again, maybe in about four weeks time. We'll collate some more questions, go through those and see how we do. So uh, thank you very much for joining me. And I hope that you have a good rest of the evening.